Hi, I'm Daniel Anstandig. Welcome to our three-part series on robots, mind, body, and soul. This is the season finale of Innovation 19. Alexa, turn off music. Alexa, Alexa, turn off music. There we go. Not too long ago, the idea of having someone in your home listening to you at all times would have sounded downright creepy. But nowadays, it's commonplace. In fact, we get annoyed when Alexa or Siri aren't listening. Welcome to Innovation 19's three-part series on robots, mind, body, and soul. We're going to do an episode on each mind, body, and soul, breaking down innovations and future projections in the field of robotics and focusing on implications for entertainment and media consumption. This episode, all about the mind of the robot. All right, so what defines the mind of a machine? Some would argue that robots, or computers, have brains, but not necessarily minds. We can see how our human brain, which uses neurochemistry to transmit information, is analogous to a computer brain using electricity. We can even see similarities in how human brains and computer brains process information. They both have working memory, or RAM, long-term storage. They can conjure up data in milliseconds. But what about the more esoteric part of the brain, the mind? What defines the mind of a robot? Is it what we call artificial intelligence? And then, what defines artificial intelligence? Today, we're surrounded by AI, waiting to support us at our beck and call. But how does AI play into the future of media and entertainment in terms of how we interact with content, consume content, and create content? To begin, let's talk about what artificial intelligence actually is. In its most reductive definition, AI is basically any intelligence demonstrated by a machine. As humans, despite what we may believe about ourselves, we're not actually that great at recalling facts, making calculations, or even solving logical problems. But there is something we excel at, and that is recognizing patterns. So if a computer can find patterns and extrapolate beyond those patterns, we call that intelligence. Humans are pattern-seeking creatures. That's because recognizing patterns like, this is the tree where I can find fruit, or this is the spot where the angry lion likes to hang out, has been evolutionary advantageous for our species. And we actually, as humans, love patterns so much that we look for patterns where they don't exist. Studies have been done on this. There was actually a study where people were left in a room with randomly chiming buzzers, and most of the participants desperately tried to figure out the cause of the chiming. They were assuming that there had to be a pattern, and some people ended up creating elaborate physical routines like touching ceiling tiles in a certain order or tapping their foot in a complicated Morse code and so on, convinced that the right pattern would trigger the entirely random chimes. Those subjects, by the way, left at the end of the experiment feeling like they had won the game, but there was no game at all. There was no pattern. And many of the subjects didn't even believe when they were told that there wasn't a pattern, that there wasn't one. So try convincing us humans not to continue developing more and more sophisticated pattern-seeking artificial intelligence. Since the human mind is obsessed with patterns, we've designed AI that is the same way. It focuses on patterns and then making deductions based on that. And we are delighted when our machines find patterns for us. Think about this. When Spotify recommends a playlist that you might like and all the songs feel just spot on, completely catered for you, you get a little boost of dopamine. Your brain gets excited by this pattern-generating accomplishment. And AI finding patterns in things, then serving them back up to us, feels personal and intimate, even if it's just algorithmic. In simple terms, patterns make us happy, Artificial intelligence makes us happy. In fact, AI has become so ubiquitous in our day-to-day -day existence. We encounter AI in everything from chess playing computers to self-driving cars. And even though any pattern-seeking machine could be called AI, the term artificial intelligence is more often used to describe something with advanced computational power, like something that harbors an intelligence on par with its human counterparts, or at the very least, something that learns from experience and adjusts itself accordingly. For instance, look at your Google search bar. Google has already collected tons of data about you, whether you realize it or not, so different people will see different personalized results popping up when they do a Google search. Try something with me. Go to Google on your phone or your computer, and in your Google search bar, type music is, 
and then see what comes up and ask a friend what they see. It's different. You'll see something totally different because Google's predictive search text is undeniably AI. It's taking old inputs into account that you've already entered into a search, and now it's predicting new results just for you. AI also tends to utilize deep learning and natural language processing. Deep learning means that it mimics the function of the human brain, and natural language processing means that we're communicating with AI using human language. In my opinion, and according to the opinion of many computer scientists, what differentiates AI from a computerized device, such as programming your coffee to brew at the same time every day, is the artificial mind's ability to learn and grow. So if you have a coffee maker that makes your coffee every day at 6.30 a.m., that's just a timer, nothing more. But if you have a coffee maker that takes note of your behavior and it predicts that you want more caffeine on a Wednesday morning, so it self-selects a high-caffeinated pot accordingly, that is artificial intelligence. And we could call that the mind inside the machine. Well, it may seem inconsequential that an AI could learn your caffeine intake patterns or your desires, our lives are becoming more and more saturated with ever-evolving AI, especially when it comes to our media consumption habits. That's because being human is inherently tricky. We are goal-oriented creatures. We want to make our lives easier. And it goes without saying that we love entertainment. The average American spends 11 hours a day consuming media. We delight in using less physical labor and brain power in order to get the things that we want quickly and easily, whether it's a TV show or it's a pizza that's delivered straight to our door. Our brains may be marvelous things, but they can't process things constantly or we'd become overwhelmed. Guess what? Machines don't have that problem. They don't need eight hours of sleep. They don't need food. They don't need five-minute breaks between Pomodoros. And they don't need cute animal videos on YouTube to relax. So, AI-powered virtual assistants are becoming more and more the norm. Virtual assistants are not just about making our lives easier. They're about making the content we consume even more accessible, which means increased opportunities to collect data on your behavior and suggest content based on that data. It ultimately means subtly influencing your behavior in a specific direction over time. And I know that may sound nefarious, but in the grand scheme of things, it ends up feeling a little bit like a win-win situation because you get more and more of the content you like, while advertisers and media companies and anyone else involved gets to stay in business and serve you better. So for example, Let's take the big virtual assistants on the market. And by virtual assistant, I mean AI-assisted programs that are conversational and have an identity. Virtual assistants tend to use biometric data for input. In other words, they run off of the sound of our voices. And our virtual assistants are becoming eerily good at understanding us. When you set up Siri, you only need to say five phrases for her to recognize your voice forever. I don't know if I'd be able to recognize a friend's voice that quickly. The first virtual assistant we all came to know and love is Apple's Siri, which launched on the App Store in 2010. Siri sounds female to American users, and in the UK, Siri sounds male. Not sure if you knew that. But important side note, uh, virtual assistants are almost always female in their vocal characterization, and gotta believe there's some inherent gender bias in there with AI-powered virtual assistants. In fact, even though Siri has male and female sounding voices for 34 out of 41 language options, it defaults to female for 27 of those voices, including United States English. I digress, but anyway, back to Siri. The virtual assistant has evolved over time. In the beginning, Siri would just create hours of footage of Siri bloopers, mishearing people, completely not understanding requests or questions. And now, Siri can answer almost anything we throw their way. Siri can actually get surprisingly deep when it comes to responses. Like, try asking Siri for the meaning of life. And Siri, like any good AI, keeps the score. Do you tend to call your mother every day at 5 p.m.? Siri will make a note of that and suggest dialing your mom at 5 p.m. when you pick up your phone. Likewise, Alexa, my buddy who I spoke to earlier, is able to request content for you if you choose. Let's take the command, Hey Alexa, play music I like. It should raise some questions in your mind, like how does Alexa pick what you want to listen to? How is she making those decisions? The way that Amazon describes it, they say, quote, Like an attentive BFF, best friend forever, 
As Alexa gets to know you better, she remembers your likes and dislikes, and she helps you find the perfect song or playlist. Okay, that sounds considerate and supportive, but again, how is Alexa choosing? Well, first off, Alexa doesn't play nice with others. She wants to play music selected exclusively from the Amazon ecosystem, that is, Prime Music. You can do a workaround to get Alexa to play music from your Apple or Google or Spotify libraries, but it is something that you have to set up. It's, it's a roundabout, and it's not built into the platform automatically because, of course, Amazon wants you to subscribe to their music services. Then, as Alexa plays music, you can say like or dislike and allow Alexa to remember your taste. John Coltrane comes on, you say, Alexa, I like this song. Sum 41 plays, Alexa, I don't like this song. Easy enough. But remember, Alexa has access to to your shopping profile. So she can recommend certain products or even music to you based on all of your other shopping preferences. And although Amazon has not publicly said that they do, it wouldn't be unrealistic to assume that Alexa is choosing media for you based on your taste across all platforms. Amazon already does that with your shopping cart. So if I'm a man in my mid-30s in the Cleveland area who recently purchased a snow shovel, Amazon is going to align me to a certain profile. So when I say, Alexa, play some music I like, and Steely Dan's Pretzel Logic comes roaring out of the speaker, it feels like Alexa really understands me because she does. And great choice on the Steely Dan, Alexa. You're welcome, Daniel. Let's take an even closer look at algorithms of the machine mind and how they make us feel seen and understood as humans. Algorithms are one of the greatest creations in modern history, on on one hand, and terribly annoying on another. Let's take something we can all relate to right now. Netflix's predictive watch next algorithm. You log into Netflix and a show is recommended to you. And it seems fairly seamless But just think about the architecture behind this for a second, all of the data points that are required. Netflix doesn't just know how long you watch things, it knows when you paused the show, when you rewinded, when you fast forwarded, how many days it took you to watch, what time of day you were watching, and if you took their recommendation to watch it in the first place, what's more, now it knows that it's on the right track. It knows your age, it knows your geographic location, it knows the history of everything you've ever watched on the platform. And then it can link that data to all other people in the United States who just watched the Great British Bake Off and recommend that you watch a show about glass blowing. <laughs> so, what's the downside? As we've discussed before on this podcast, recommending content based on things you already enjoy can create an echo chamber effect. You may lose the magic that comes from stumbling on a new favorite show or movie, something completely outside your usual watch list, like the Black Box Theater one-man magic show in and of itself on Hulu, which you should watch. This is one of the reasons that I find bookstores so magical. You can browse and stumble upon things. That magical human experience gets lost when you digitize everything in the world. And that human moment of divine circumstance or serendipity where you stumble on an unexpected book or a gem that's no longer there if you're just on Amazon or Netflix and you're always served up by algorithms. So I'm a fan of the robot mind, no doubt, but I'm a bigger fan of the human experience. Here's another example. The Beatles. Who doesn't love the Beatles? Well, here's a Beatles song for you. Does it sound a bit strange? That's because it's 100% the Beatles, but it wasn't created by the Beatles. That's the musical work of an AI called Flow Machines that was implemented by Sony's CSL Research Lab in France. The AI was given all the Beatles songs to digest, and then it produced this track. But there is something unsettling about how it sounds to me, something decidedly not human about it. The tones feel a little eerie as opposed to like actually melodic, and the lyrics are abstract, which, you know, is kind of standard for the Beatles, but it just doesn't really match the song. I think the core of this issue and what's wrong with this song is there's a lack of humanity. There's another example of this, too. Something similar happened in France. They have a collective called Obvious that fed its GAN, or Generative Adversarial Network uh, software, the art history of many different French works. And then it asked the AI to paint a portrait in the style of the old masters like Rembrandt. And the result was a portrait of a man 
who never existed that actually went to auction in 2018 and it earned $432,000. Look the portrait up when you have a chance. Like the faux Beatles song, there's something creepy about this thing, but, you know, it is like one of a kind. It's not like AI shouldn't be a part of the artistic process. I actually had a conversation in an earlier podcast with Taryn Southern, and she created an album called I Am Human that used AI and a number of open source AI platforms, including Amper Music, to create the music. But she made sure to inject her humanity into every step of the project. She wrote her own lyrics, she used her own voice to sing the song, and every few months an article is released with a clickbait title like, Why AI Will Replace Artists, or The End of Music Writers and Songwriters Is Near. But so far, frankly, purely AI artwork has been distinguishable from art created by human artists, and sometimes kind of laughably so. When used the right way, AI can make us better human artists, though. One beatboxer is embracing AI technology for his art. His name is Harry Yeff. He performs beatbox battles with a deep learning AI component. <laughs> He's basically competing with AI. And he told Wired Magazine that he loved the idea of being competitive with AI because it's making him a better artist. You can also use AI to help you craft stories for games and movies. One company called RTC Studio was part of the Y Combinator in San Francisco, and they raised $10 million last year to develop their latest software offering. They take tons of human-written storylines and then they let AI extrapolate from them in real time so that characters can react appropriately to any situation. The implications are kind of fun for something like a video game, because if you think about this, the possibilities for you as a player in a video game to do or say anything virtually inside the game, and then have the game generate responses to you in real time, acting just like people would, I mean, that's seriously cool. So the original creative input for the script comes from a human mind, but we can use AI to up-level ourselves. And as we've discussed in my Mandalorian episode, go back a few episodes in Innovation 19 and shout out to my main dude, Baby Yoda, AI-assisted tech like LED backgrounds used by ILM Stagecraft are the future of shooting TV and film. This includes AI-powered procedurally generated backdrops as well as the background changing itself for the camera as it moves for a shot. Given the limitations of travel that still exist, expect to see more and more high-concept shows shot like this. And the tech is often so good, you won't even know it was an LED screen. In other words, like playing chess against the computer in order to get better, using AI as a creative partner can assist us in up-leveling our artistic endeavors. Rather than replacing us, AI is powerful for us as artists, consumers, and creators, and as marketers. It helps us to improve. It helps us to find things we like and avoid things we don't like. It helps us to find art that other people will like and avoid creating art or marketing that other people won't like. But I'd like to go on the record and say that AI is best as a helper or collaborator as opposed to the sole artist or key decision maker. And one of the reasons that I say this is that because we know how a computer works, we aren't 100% sure how the brain works. Even in 2021, a year that sounds so incredibly futuristic, all the goings-on inside our craniums is a mystery. And that's exciting, don't you think? And the mystery of the human mind is compelling and inspiring. I don't know if the robot mind is quite there yet. For now, the machine mind seems almost synonymous with the term brain. Intelligent, impressive, but lacking that extra spark that distinguishes the brain from the mind. So until we 100% understand our own minds, there is no way we can possibly replicate them. Although, as we'll discuss in our third part of this series, scientists and startups are already trying to do so with the white whale of consciousness uploading. Stay tuned for that in our series here about robots, mind, body, and soul. Until then, my verdict, AI is a content curator that can lead us into an echo chamber effect where you're always recommended the same things, just like how I've always encouraged my listeners to intentionally follow Twitter accounts with different views than your own uh, to escape the echo chamber. 
I think it's always great to test the algorithm's boundaries. If you like rock music on Spotify, listen to some classical. Listen to some pop. Use the algorithm for your own benefit. Don't let the AI mind use you. And if you're in marketing, and in many ways we all are, then use the data that AI provides in order to improve your outreach to be more specific. At Futuri, we use AI in a number of major ways. Topic Pulse, our AI-powered story discovery system and social content system, and Topline, Futuri's revolutionary sales intelligence system that pairs cutting-edge AI with expert human analysis. These are examples of how AI can help us to up-level our offerings in broadcast media and gain insights like never before. According to Salesforce, one of the key pillars of the so-called fourth industrial revolution, or Industry 4.0, is AI. 59% of hiring managers believe that AI will impact the type of skills their companies need. But 62% of customers are nervous about how companies will use their personal data. This creates a responsibility for business owners to utilize AI, but have a fair amount of transparency with their audience about what data they're collecting and how it's being used. And when that transparency is there, all the good things about AI can exist and the customer can feel seen and feel good about where we're going. If the robot mind is the fourth industrial revolution, well, I see this as a revolution of connection. Man and machine working side by side, creating a more interesting, creative world. And that's our first episode of three about robots, mind, body, and soul. In our next episode, we'll talk about the body of the robot. I'm Daniel Einstandig, and this has been Innovation 19. Like many other podcasters, we're using Post by Futuri to create, publish, and optimize this episode. Learn more about why some of the world's top brands rely on Post to power their podcasts at futurimedia.com.